You mentioned one to me the last time we spoke about the the grasses in the shallows in the ocean. Um, can you remind me of the details of that? What's happening there? Sure. I, I, one of the really uh, alarming aspects of the modern day, and again, look, you and I both know that you can talk yourself into an ever greater sort of free zone of horror of my wife, Barbara, watching The Conjuring last night, a horror movie. She finally said, turn it off, turn it off. Don't go down into the basement, right? So you can make, ah, you can make so scared. But there are scary things happening. And the scary ones that are close to home, and I had a grad student, uh, Ricky Dooley, whom you met here. Mm -hmm. Ricky's PhD was to look at the shallow water grass fields in the oceans. And so we have huge, what used to be, huge areas of seagrass, is called. And there's a couple of species, one is Zostra, Thalassinoides. Those things are, are a grass that looks just like your lawn grass, except they're in the ocean, salt water, but they're very shallow. Why are they important? Most of the world's important fisheries, baby fish hide in the seagrass. Seagrass is a hugely important aspect for fisheries. And don't get me started on fisheries, of course, but if we want to have lots of fish, we want these seagrasses. So what's happened in Puget Sound, and I live in a place where the native, the most common forests were old growth, gigantic cedar trees, and enormous Douglas firs. And these are big trees. I mean, we are talking big trees. They, those forests, went all the way down to the shoreline. There are a couple of wonderful books about how the first people to western Washington, they hated the forests because it's, they're really dark where the first where they lived they're underneath this canopy we get low light clouds all winter it's like nighttime in an old growth forest they hated it and they did a very good job of cutting down most of it where they cut down first were the places you could get the trees big trees out fastest on the shoreline you could cut down the trees that went right to the shoreline right to the ground you've got your boat right there you haul it off to the mills the first trees to go lined Puget Sound, which is hundreds and hundreds of miles of glacially cut, beautiful shoreline areas with bays and inlets and all this stuff. And then there's rivers. Well, when you cut down all those trees, trees grow back. But what grew back and what is common everywhere are gigantic big leaf maple trees. This was a conifer forest replaced entirely by deciduous leaf dropping trees. Puget Sound, the estuary, every fall now has untold tons of leaves falling into it that never fell in it before. Never. All those leaves fall into the shallow area, they get buried quickly, and they rot. As they rot, they produce hydrogen sulfide, this very toxic gas. So Ricky and we had this instrument. You poke it into the sand. It tells you how much H2S is there. Everywhere in these places that used to be seagrass are now completely bubbling up a toxic killer gas, hydrogen sulfide. It's killed the seagrass. It's not just here. Seagrass is dying all over the world. This is a huge global problem because seagrass does what? It takes CO2 and it turns it into oxygen. We're removing one of the biggest areas for, it's like a rainforest in the ocean, the shallow marine. Those are going away. So my, my understanding is a year old at least on this, but I think oxygen in the oceans has dropped by 2% in the last 40 years. Is that correct? I don't keep up with those figures. You are a much better figure person than I am. I just know that I look, I'm a, I, I do look, and I see the ecological changes taking place around here. And we think of a, a oxygen in the atmosphere as, as a constant number it is. But remember that in water, it's a whole different situation. The water doesn't mix. And so if you're at a low oxygen content, even in shallow water, that could be completely decoupled from the atmosphere above it. So yes, we could have a lower oxygen level. We're still at 21% in the atmosphere, but the shallow water areas are themselves lower and it is dropping. And so I really, it's gonna be a case by case basis to your number, but the lower oxygen in marine systems 
really affects a lot of stuff. And the other aspect that is affecting us too, Nate, is acidity. As you know, I grew up in Puget Sound. And one of the great pleasures here is to walk around and get an oyster off the rocks. The area at the North Pacific is no, now so acid rich. I mean, the acidity is so high that oysters can no longer naturally grow in this area that have been have oysters for literally millions of years. The spat are so tiny, the little veals are larvae, they've got a little bitty shell on the back. Uh, the acid is so high that the shell dissolves off their back and they die. We can't grow oysters here anymore. When, when you talked about earlier this summer when Seattle hit 107 degrees, wasn't there that those weeks there was like several billion sea creatures died from that heat wave? Including oysters and mollusks oh, way and more everything. Than that, Nate. Way more than that. Uh, I, I actually had a, a student who apply and wants to be a grad student with me. And she said, what's the best problem you can think of? I said, well, we've just had a mass extinction event here. You could look at the intertidal from Seattle, all of Puget Sound, but go all the way up to BC, all the way to Alaska. What happens to those untold billions of shallow water animals that during the low tide, the heat fried them and cooked them in their shell. Do you imagine the stink we had, the rotting smell, the hydrogen sulfide, but now we have a layer that we can go back to one day. This is a dead zone. 